Hello, uh, good afternoon and welcome. We are streaming live from Hakove today for the day two of This Is Not Anarchy, This Is Chaos. Our second day of a binge watch of talks, lectures, films and, and uh, performances featuring um, artists, theorists and activists whose works refuse the seduction and desire of technological promises and logic. So today concludes our year-long inquiry to refusal and our speakers will ask questions about the role refusal plays in negotiating and opening up new values of calculation and computation. But just before I pass over to our moderator for the day, Rachel O'Dwyer, I wanted to remind everybody that is here in Berlin that of our evening program tonight here at Hakave, we'll have a closing keynote by Bong Chol Han. The lecture will unpack the role of idleness and inaction as a deliberate political act of refusal. So I wanted to thank everybody for watching and I'm just gonna pass you now over to our moderator for the day, Rachel. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nora. And also thank you so much for the invitation to moderate uh, the panels and the discussions today. Um, so before handing over to our first speaker, uh, Olufemi, I'm going to just speak a little bit to some of the themes that are emerging from the panels, from the lectures and conversations uh, that we're seeing today. So themes of, of debt, economic imaginaries, um, new ways of calculating and, and maybe also new forms of compromise. So many of the sessions that we're going to see today deal with different facets of debt from quite pragmatic projects that focus on divestment or slow finance or the economics of degrowth to those that unpack the connections between colonialism, climate change and moral liability to thinking about the relationship between debt and refusal. Olufemi Taiwo, for example, um, who's up next, is speaking about the morality of debt in the context of the pandemic, but also in the context of climate change. Um, usually when I see these two ideas together, debt and moral obligation, uh, I think of the opening of David Graeber's debt um, and the conversation that Graeber has with this uh, quite earnest NGO worker um, where she sort of, he's trying to explain to her basically um, about IMF imposed austerity and she says well surely these countries who are struggling have they have a sort of a moral obligation one has to repay one's debts and um, debt's so pernicious because it sort of folds together economic obligations with moral condemnation so a nation has to repay its debts and if you're also an indebted subject if you're someone who's maybe struggling with debt then also it's maybe somehow your fault and in the Graeber example, one has to repay one's debts. It's this insidious moral argument justifying untold horrors. So for Graeber, for example, he, he was working, uh, doing field work in Madagascar at the time. And he describes how IMF austerity programs there meant cutting funding for malaria eradication um, programs in the area. So 10,000 people died. Um, and that particular calculation wasn't recorded in the ledger. So Denise de Ferrer de Silva, whose work is referenced, I think, quite a lot in the panel, uh, in discussions today, particularly in the panel uh, IOUs and debt, calls this unpayable debt. So debt that isn't yours to pay um, and which you, you know, might actually be impossible to pay, but which you're expected to repay. Olufemi Taiwo, who's speaking next, is, is flipping that argument to make a moral argument for reparations for slavery and for climate change. So perhaps the unpayable debt there is the incalculable reparations that we owe to developing nations, recognising what's owed and can't possibly be enumerated. And that's done by arguing for the moral liabilities for the reparation of things like slavery and climate change. And the theme for this year's Transmedialis, we already know, is refusal. When we think of debt in terms of refusal, it maybe sounds like we're speaking about striking debt or refusing to pay or refusing to support particular models of investment and finance, uh, refusing to play ball, stepping outside of the financial system in some kind of a way. But we can also frame repaying debts for colonialism or climate change in terms of refusal. Um, so, for example, we, we did a special issue on refusal for Nora last year, and one of the authors, Colin Keedy Tavel, used this definition of debt in their refusal, um, in their essay on refusal that I'd never heard of. So, they argue that the idea of uh, refusal has this sort of economic or transactional root. So, refusal from the Latin refundre, 
to pour or to give back. Um, so refusal can also be a refund. And that's also used by Amer in their provocations for a conversation with Jack Halverston that's taking place later today. So refusal isn't necessarily about the dialectic, like no or the no part, I, I would prefer not to. Refusal can be about returning something owed or a refund. And part of refusing climate change uh, might be found in reparations for, for slavery or in recognizing the moral liabilities of the North in climate change negotiations. What strikes me about that provocation is that the call to repay our debts opens onto this huge incalculable thing. Like we can't possibly repay all that we owe to the biosphere and to the subjects of slavery or colonialism. And the very, the very demand that we, that we repay kind of folds into itself the fact that such a debt is, in some ways, it's incalculable, it's, it's unpayable. And the sort of realization of that, that sort of unpayability, made me think of um, Silvia Federici's campaign, Wages for Housework, or actually sometimes it's called Wages Against Housework in the 1970s. And the demand for a wage for invisible or uncounted women's work um, sort of throws up the question, like how do you begin to try and calculate for this kind of invisible work? How can we account for the hidden externalities of economic devastation or, or slavery or all the invisible work and suffering that keeps the, the economy afloat, that shores it up? Um, Federici qualifies this in her manifesto. She basically says, like we're asking for a wage not necessarily because the wage is, is it's what's, what's so important. Like economic freedom for women, you know, would be great. Just like a green climate tax, for example, would be great. But also there was a knowledge that the demand for the wage staged, staged the first semantic conditions for the very possibility of refusal. So it's this sort of aesthetic demand and it's this aesthetic, this, the power of a demand that can possibly be met. Um, but just imagine maybe for a moment if it were, I think that sort of demand, that aesthetic demand, carries the true power of refusal. And in calling for something maybe that feels impossible, I feel like maybe art gives us the space also to refuse, to demand or imagine beyond the pragmatics of ordinary political speech. And I think a number of panels, talks and films that we're going to see today do this kind of uh, imaginary work. They're dreaming of other economies, in particular the, in particular the panel on IOU, capital debts and promises, where we're going to find, I think, various sort of speculative imaginaries, weird economies, financial fictions. Or I think we could also think of maybe the work of Patricia Dominguez and Nicole Nuillier, uh, Leche Holographia. Um, so I was watching uh, watching the video sort of in advance of, of today and reading a little bit about it, this really beautiful uh, short film that you're going to see later on today. And I found it was part of a show that was commissioned by the International Development Bank. And I came across a description as well of, of, of the work um, that said, artists have a special gift of highlighting and imaginatively addressing society's most challenging issues. And it really struck me that this description of the work, it was, it was quite a typical kind of economic justification for art. So kind of art's going to find the way out and offer us all a solution. Um, but to say, I think, that these artworks offer alternatives is, maybe to use another economic phrase, sort of selling the work short. Um, it's like art's job is to find a way out of the economic mess that we're all in. I think these works can offer stages for different forms of refusal or mutual aid and healing, but maybe it's more interesting to think of them as, as provocations that can't really be squared away or accounted for in terms of their utility or their use value. Later on in um, our keynote session today, we have a conversation between Jack Halberstam and Amr Kangizer, um, as well as a keynote by Bjorn Chulhan, um, where we have explorations of the power of inertia and acts of uselessness as a form of refusal. So Jack Halberstam, for example, is exploring the work of artists like Alvin Baltrop and Cameron Rowland. So artists who are staging embodied or architectural forms of uselessness as, as a refusal of valuation and of gentrification. I think art can be a space for refusing productivity precisely because often it produces nothing much. Um, art, so the French critic Maurice Blanchot argues, acts poorly and little. As soon as art measures itself against action, immediate and pressing action can only put it in the wrong. Um, 
in Not Working, psychoanalyst Josh Cohn explores art semantic origins and uselessness in deliberately being kind of unproductive or pointless pursuits. And he sort of argues, you know, if we were to value art as the one, maybe we should value art as the one space where economic measure and the quest for productivity doesn't actually apply. And I think we're sort of seeing that maybe playing out in some of the works that we're going to look at today and some of the conversations. In the past year, though, we've encountered different forms of refusal and imagining in the economic sphere. Um, Thursday, for example, was the one year anniversary of GameStop, this parasitical intervention on the financial trading system that was brought about by by the popularity of, of retail investment apps, basically people who were at home and online. Um, and I think a lot of us were sort of left scratching our heads and asking like, what kind of refusal was this? Despite the fact that the intervention ended up making loads of money for the market maker behind the retail app, GameStop is still sometimes lauded as this economic refusal that was buoyed along by the power of the crowd, uh, the power of collective organization. You know, look what we could do if we just organized together. But in the end, maybe it was a refusal that was a little bit more, more cynical. Uh, GameStop monetized a sense of collectivity, maybe at a surface level, you know, a sense of banding together, while at the same time, very close underneath the surface, I guess, was a kind of nihilistic belief that there's no such thing as collectivity or collective responsibilities or, in, you know, just only apes, I guess, to use the kind of financial term or individual hustlers. And maybe also that there's no such thing as meaningful political intervention or refusal, but just irony, imitation, schadenfreude, a kind of refusal of refusal. You know, this isn't anarchy, this is chaos. And if this is the collective imaginary of refusal, it seems to beg the question, like, how do we imagine economic alternatives based on where we are right now and based on the kind of like subjectivity that we, I guess, you know, as, as sort of um, people in, in sort of developed economies have, uh, subjects in debt, trained to this kind of very high individualism, um, you know, trained to sort of carry our own risks. Um, what kinds of refusals or futures are we imagining from that particular space? And to steal a line from Cassie Thornton, you know, an artist who does a lot of work about debt, um, can we be trusted to imagine other futures? You know, are we the right people to, to do the imagining? Maybe, arguably not. I think that's actually what's what's so great about Transmediali and the programme is that we are we're getting that sort of perspective on other imaginaries, you know, other other ways of thinking. Um, some of the other conversations today then deal with living in the ruins, in the ruins of capitalism and the possibilities for resistance or, or mutual aid that emerge from these spaces of collapse. So Elaine Gann's work, for example, on entanglement in the Californian wetlands is really key here. You know, she's looking at these spaces that destroy ecologies, but also maybe foster new ecologies at the same time. And, you know, it's very, very complicated. Uh, many of the conversations today and yesterday have resonances with Anna Singh's uh, work, um, A Mushroom at the End of the World on Living in Capitalist Ruins. Um, but that particularly Elaine Gann's work, I guess it made me think about a, quite an old paper. I think it's from like 2001, maybe by geographer Nicholas Blomley, which was about hedges in the 17th century enclosure movement. Um, so this moment where the commons or collective kind of ideas of ownership um, were being destroyed. And he looked at kind of the ways in which the hedge, the site of newly private property and new agrarian practices, also then became sites of mutual aid. So people grew things in the hedges or they kind of subsisted on stuff that grew in the hedges and they sheltered in them and they hidden them uh, when they were sort of attacking uh, their colonizers and they also burned them down. Um, Jack Halberstam in his essay for Transmediali for the Almanac um, explores how ruins and spaces of collapse also become spaces where it's possible maybe to, to live differently while Amr uh, Kangizer is exploring in, in their paper how ruins can also be the basis for mutual aid and care. But I think maybe also there can be a tendency to like romanticize these ruins because um, they're also often spaces of necessity or even desperation. Like half of the world's population actually requires some kind of subsistence economy or mutual aid just to get by not because it's a nice thing to do you know or a nice way to live but because it's it's just necessary for survival because the wage isn't 
adequate basically for survival. Things like shared childcare, you know, grandparents taking care of children, growing your own food. And we could also say, you know, these kinds of uh, subsistence economies are also really necessary for capitalism. Uh, there's a famous World Economic uh, Forum report from the 1990s where for the first time the World Economic Forum sort of did a U-turn away from refusing forms of collective ownership towards sort of recognising their centrality basically to capitalism, how important they were in sort of shoring up an inadequate wage economy. So there's compromise here, there's a lot of moral and ambiguity going on. Um, they shore up, as I said, ca capitalism, but you know, maybe they also provide uh, spaces or sites for resistance. And then finally today, uh, many of today's panels are also dealing with different forms of calculation, particularly in the economic sphere. So I was at a, I guess we'd call it a fintech conference now, uh, a good few years ago, where a CEO was presenting an algorithmic credit scoring system that they wanted to roll out on the back of smartphone adoption in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so that's a space, you know, where there wasn't sort of ready access to bank accounts, but a lot of people had access to a 2G and maybe now even a smartphone. And the proposal, which is really familiar to us now, was to use the data then from smartphone adoption to provision and to underwrite credit for the unbanked or the digital subprime in the absence of traditional banking data. And that sort of action, and you know, particularly in that conference, was being framed as something laudable, you know, financial inclusion, uh, banking the unbanked, etc. Uh, describing anyway this machine learning system that he'd built, the, the CEO described it as this like robot in the sky. And I just remember him saying, you know, it was this thing crunching the numbers that was better at choosing people than people could ever be. And we see that sort of idea of, of algorithms and machine learning playing out today. Uh, but, but arguably that idea that numbers are better at choosing people has origins in the Enlightenment, where we first see the idea that we might remove the messiness of like human judgment and replace it with nonpartisan, indifferent calculations. For example, we see in something like um, William Petty's Political Arithmetic, um, I think a book from like the 1700s, I forget now. Um, but he had this theory that numerical or statistical analysis produced what he called a disinterested politics. Uh, and that was very instrumental in the colonization of Ireland, which in itself was kind of colonialism light, you know, it was a test bed for much more extreme forms of colonialism elsewhere. Um, so algorithmic politics and calculation, I'd argue, is based on the idea that you can replace politics in some ways with economics. There's a sense that AI and the free market can be used to solve problems or that economic imperatives can be used to sort of subsume moral imperatives. We've seen that a lot in crypto and blockchain today. So what are the consequences of these forms of calculation and their extension through machine learning and through training data? And that's a question that's being asked by talks and discussions today. Of particular note, uh, Cindy kine lins explorations of data annotation labour, exploring how ground truth has shaped and been shaped by traditional exchanges of mapping between Southeast Asia and the US. And Lynn, I think, is exploring a moment where algorithms aren't used just to support other ways of knowing, but to produce entirely new understandings of what constitutes the real. The panel calculation otherwise this afternoon then asks if refusal can open up the possibilities to sort of reimagine calculation. You know, what might calculation otherwise look like? Maybe it's in works that try to disrupt or queer computing and code. Uh, Fanuel Antwi's amazing keynote yesterday provoked the possibility of dubbing instead of coding, for example. Um, or maybe it's in forms of knowledge and world making or on making that decenter the human. As for example, Elsa Bray explores in her video piece, Notes for Les Sangres, a kind of mapping that centers non-computational and non-human forms of calculation. Or maybe it could be in noise or glitch, obfuscation, practices that are specifically designed to sort of disrupt machine seeing and calculation. Um, I think something we're going to see or maybe see explored a little bit in our final conversation today on unknowing and unworlding, where I believe uh, Jack and Amar are, are going to deal actually with, with real noise, with the work of uh, artists like Pauline Oliveros and John Cage as forms of stage noise and stage nothing. Um, so there's a whole range of content in this very rich programme. Welcome to day two of Transmediale. This is not anarchy, this is chaos.
Just wanted to give a very, very brief housekeeping note. Um, for those of you who are watching the stream, you can click join discussion in order to uh, join the Telegram group and post question and answers to um, our speakers today. Um, so um, I'd just like to introduce our next speaker now, Olafemi, Olafemi uh, Taiwo. Um, and, and just so Olafemi is speaking on climate reparations and planning. The political crisis of climate, COVID, and democracy stem from the same history. The construction of a global racial empire over recent centuries made possible by slavery and colonial domination. Our planetary economic and political system creates and distributes resources and vulnerability according to a logic that's determined by capital and increasingly the algorithms that manage its movement. The current world is being planned by these algorithms and the elites who direct them. And those plans clearly leave most of us at the mercy of the coming ecological chaos. Both reparations for the slavery and colonialism that built our present political order and the fight for climate justice requires, Olafemi is going to argue, moving decision-making power from the hands of elites into genuinely grassroots and democratic methods of planning. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second day of this year's Transmediale Symposium. This is not anarchy, this is chaos. My name is Danny Adnes, one of this year's symposium curators, and it is a pleasure to be here with you remotely on this morning. At a time of continuing pandemic, where many are dealing with the state-sanctioned state violence against sick and vulnerable bodies, and all are feeling a myriad of losses, I'd like to take a moment just to thank again artistic director Nora and Merku, the entire Transmediale team, my symposium co curator Elise Masao Hunchuk, film curator Ben Evans James, and exhibition curator Lorena Juan, who have worked incredibly hard with me to facilitate this event during much uncertainty. Thank you also to all our inspirational artists and speakers for their continued enthusiasm and patience as we have worked to navigate the current situation. After being part of an incredible curatorial team who have explored various and diverse gestures of refusal and their relations to art and technology for a year now, I will say um, a few brief words about the two themes of the symposium belief and compromise and their intersections, before handing over to our in-person moderator for the day, Rachel O'Dwyer. Yesterday, our speakers and filmmakers explored refusal through the lens of belief. They inquired into how belief systems have long been implemented or relied upon to imagine and control our own worlds or the worlds of others. From cartography to open source, decentralization to discriminatory algorithmic practices, grand visions embedded within carbon and silicon have the power to bring many people together to accomplish great things. But they also have the power to suppress alternative knowledge systems and ways of being. As we saw yesterday, refusals to these ways don't only come from below, they can also come from above, from the state, suppressing alternative knowledge systems and ways of being. On first reading, the second day's theme of compromise may seem incompatible with refusal and belief. Where compromise is understood as a mutual promise, a series of concessions or the flows of give and take, refusal is often thought of as a blunter instrument, demonstrating that what is good for some is not by any means good for everyone. Across the year, I have had many independent conversations with people in which they have shared their doubts about refusal as a practice. Is opting out of services, tools and platforms a futile position to take? Is non-compliance what is needed at a time when many are trapped in neoliberal and atomized systems and structures, feedback loops and a centralized internet? Not to mention the collective labour that will be required to try to meet the great transformation and interlinking crises that lay ahead. These concerns, I think, are driven by a wish for commonality and shared visions. But a year of listening, reading and watching acts of refusal humbly reminds us that any hope or resolution or a reconciliation 
or even moving forward <laughs> is often far from easy or straightforward. Oftentimes there are numerous problematic assumptions. There's no clear solutions and competing ideas of what we actually mean by right or good. Living together in this friction means operating from compromise always. Today our closing chapter begins with an inquiry into how difficult the pathways towards reconciliation are. Who should account for crimes? How can we pay back debts, both moral and economic? How should the burdens and benefits of a just transition be assigned? These are some of the questions that our presenters will be asking and answering today. I will now pass over to Rachel, who will introduce today's event. Thank you.